is for keeping you waiting. It's been a busy morning. We've had back-to-back -back meetings. Uh, can I thank you all for being here? Acknowledge the Minister for Police and Community Safety, the Honourable Jack Debson, the Commissioner Designate Ian Stewart, uh, and we're here today to talk about the crime stats. Uh, the Minister will start off. I'll make a few comments. Yep. We'll go to Ian, and we've got uh, a display that Ian will speak to as well. And then after we've said our few words. Uh, Shane, you the display. We're happy to take questions. Minister, thank you again. Thanks, Commissioner. And uh, I'll obviously, again, like to welcome everyone here this morning. This morning, obviously, is the, uh, the tabling of the uh, statistical uh, analysis review for 2011-2012. That uh, annual statistical review has been tabled in Parliament today. But also, we will also be announcing the uh, 15 years of police statistics that uh, will now become available online. And uh, that is all part of uh, the government's open and accountable uh, uh, new procedures in relation to releasing data out into the community. This is only the first step in ensuring that uh, data is available to the community and uh, of obviously that we get that feedback from the community. So uh, I'd just like to pass to the Commissioner for his opening statements in relation to the, uh, the service review. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Uh, unfortunately, this year it's not good news. Uh, crime, in terms of property crime, is up by six percent. Property crime is property is crime that relates to basically theft. So it's things like the theft of motor vehicles, which is showing the greatest increase, uh, in breaking into people's homes and businesses, which is showing the next highest increase. We think there's a link between those two. One of the really disturbing trends that's emerged in recent years is that because motor vehicles have become so hard now to hotwire, mm. in fact it's almost impossible to do that, uh, some years ago it was quite easy really <coughs> to start a vehicle without the keys, almost impossible to do that now. The disturbing trend is that people, criminals, um, are breaking into people's homes to steal the car keys and then stealing the car. So there's a break and enter of the house and then the theft of the vehicle. And it's a terrible thing to have to ask, but we're, we're asking people to actually hide their car keys, to hide their car keys um, in their own homes. Uh, but that's a really disturbing trend for us. Um, uh, offences against the person are up by 2%, uh, and they relate to all offences that relate to any form of violence. Uh, and uh, what we call other offences are also up by 2%, but that's police generated activity, that's things like public disorder, those sorts of things. So. I don't think that that is of any concern. Um, as, as you'll see later, crime generally uh, has come down in Queensland in the last 12 to 15 years, particularly the last 12 years. Overall, the rates of crime are still down. But this is a disappointing development this year. It's one that we're concerned about. Uh, and I know the police department under Ian Stewart's leadership will do all it can uh, to turn this trend around. Uh, the first three months of this statistical year is, as you know, the crime figures statistical year are the same as the financial year, so it's from uh, June to July each year. Uh, the first three months of this statistical year so <coughs> far are showing some improvement, but it's far too early to call, uh, and we acknowledge as well that those first three months, uh, which are July, August and September, are the cooler months of the year, and crime tends to be down in the cooler months and increase um, you know, in the warmer months, so it's too early to say. Uh, but, but we are pleased that there is some improvement showing in those first three months. Can I just say this as well, and please don't under any circumstances think that, that we're not concerned about this and we're not going to do all we can to pull it back, but, but for ten years in a row, uh, people in the Queensland Police Department were able to reduce crime, um, and that was a pretty good effort in my view. I wish I could say to you, and I'm sure Ian would as well, that every year we'll reduce crime for the Queensland community. The reality of that would be that one day there would be no crime. If every year we could reduce um, breaking and entering offences, one day there wouldn't be any. Um, so we know that that's not viable, but please don't think on our part that that's a cop-out um, or that we're, uh, we're easing up, we're not. Um, but um, somewhere in there is obviously a balance where it will get harder and harder to reduce crime. Um, so probably that's all I need to say at the moment, but happy to stay here as long as you wish. Ask, answer questions today about this or any other topic, and if need be, follow up in due course. Uh, thank you, Minister. And could I hand now to uh, Ian, who will make some comments, but then also introduce you to what we're releasing today for the public. Thanks, Commissioner, and thanks, Minister. Good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly I'd like just to draw your... 
<clears throat> Modern technology. Yep. It's all right. Again, uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I'd just like to uh, comment on the other offences category, which has increased, as the Commissioner said, by 6% in the last uh, statistical year. And as the Commissioner rightly said, uh, other offences often are an indication of the effort of your police department. And in particular, I'd like to identify that drug offences have uh, risen by 10% and uh, good order, good order offences by 6%. And they've contributed to that increase. Most of that work is, is, shows the efforts of our police getting out um, and identifying and arresting people for those particular offences. So in, in one way, whilst any increase of crime is, is not uh, in terms of uh, the statistical nature of, the, uh, of crime is not a good look. Uh, in this category, it, it certainly is a demonstration of how committed our people are, your police department is, uh, to attacking these uh, very serious problems in our community. Um, certainly, again, as the Commissioner said, uh, overall uh, we're seeing a bounce in crime uh, and, and in those categories of property crime and personal crime, uh, we're seeing that, that slight increase. Uh, I'll, I'll be focusing on that and part of my mantra to all police officers will be to stop crime and with the assistance of the government giving us the extra police officers, the return of extra or further police officers from behind desks onto the street, I'm certainly uh, confident that we'll be able to attack crime uh, directly with that focus over the next few years. I'm um, very happy to take any questions from uh, any of you. <coughs> the first increase in crime in Queensland in 10 years? Uh, it was up slightly last year, but it was very, very slight. Mm. So some areas were up last year, but for... In the introduction, you said it fell 3% in last year's statistical review. Uh, some areas were up slightly last year, um, but for 10 years in a row prior to last year, we had reductions. Uh, and my point was simply that, um, and, I, and again, please don't think in any way we're not concerned about this and, and that we'll do all we can, but my point was simply that if we had reductions in crime every year, then one day there would be no crime. Yeah. yeah, can I say that that's a really good question? Um, there, there are two schools of thought about that. One is that if the economy is troubled and people are unemployed, that crime will go up. Uh, that seems to be the common wisdom and the common thinking, and it may well be true. There's another view that that's not necessarily so, and, and these are from people who do the research. This isn't Bob Atkinson's view. And that other view is that if people don't have an income and they're on unemployment benefits, then they haven't got anything at home really worth stealing. Um, and you can see the logic and sense in that argument as well. So the jury is probably still out. But on balance, the view is, uh, I would think, uh, that um, when things are tough economically and people are unemployed, uh, then that can contribute to an increase in crime. But there are two schools of thought about that. Since the Gold Coast has um, a disproportionately high rate of, of crime, particularly yeah, well, harm robberies traditionally in the southeast region, which takes in Logan, Coomera and the Gold Coast, armed robberies traditionally have tended to be higher than elsewhere. But, but that's a really interesting point. When you look at the rates of crime across the state, uh, the Gold Coast is, is by no means up there when you look at all categories of crime. Sadly, the rates of crime in terms of violence are highest in the far north of the state. And the tragedy of that, of course, is linked, you know, to, um, to in many cases, Indigenous communities. So the two figures are the raw figures, the actual numbers, um, and then the rates. Probably the rates are a more important measure. I mean, for example, with the road toll, uh, the best measure is the rate. That's the number of people killed each year per 100,000. In 1973 in Queensland, that was 32, 32 deaths per 100,000. In 2010, it was 5.5. You know, what a dramatic change that was. So I think rates are probably the best measure. Will you allocate any more resources to the South Eastern dis District, given that, you know, that the, there has been the most mm. dramatic increase there with armed robberies and yeah. um, break-ins? Yeah, the, the government have um, given us uh, 1,100 extra police over the next four years, which we are very, very grateful for. And, and the first 300 of those, of those 300, 100, one-third have been committed to the South East region. Uh, ten already to expand uh, the um, the uh, Serious and Violent Crime Squad, which was renamed uh, to the Major and Organised Crime Squad, to take it from 20 to 30. 
uh, and Mr. Stewart um, will, Ian will work on the uh, distribution <coughs> of the other 90 in the South East region uh, in company with the Minister and they'll probably announce that fairly soon but, but 100 extra are going to the South East region in recognition of that point that you just made. The use of motor vehicles seems to have gone up by some 22%. I know that you said that um, a lot of people are breaking into homes, getting keys. We've seen a lot of chases in the past. Do you think that that is linked, that some criminals are getting into their minds with the pursuit policy, that they won't be, uh, they won't be targeted by police like that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, I c you couldn't rule that out as a possibility. Um, but um, I couldn't say definitively that that is the reason. Um, m most of the vehicles are recovered, uh, which is a good thing. Some, of course, are not, uh, and that's, they're used in what's called rebirthing. They tend to be the more expensive vehicles and they tend to disappear very quickly interstate and are reconstructed. You know, The usual thing there is a wreck is uh, um, claimed to have been restored, but a stolen vehicle is actually used uh, in, in that space uh, as part of that. Uh, and of course some stolen vehicles, <coughs> as we have seen, are used for ram raids um, and, and crim other criminal activity and some are used simply for joyriding. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a good question but I don't think we've got a clear answer to it as yet as to whether it's linked. I would hope uh, that the increase in the theft of vehicles uh, is not linked to the pursuit policy because that's such an important issue. Well, and our view, well, the, we understand the frustration of everyone associated with that. But ultimately, um, you know, we just don't want someone killed when they drive through a green light at night time and a stolen vehicle um, at high speed goes through the red light and hits them and kills them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's such a difficult and complex area, but we think that public safety overrides, you know, mm. the value of a stolen car. And that's right. A, steal a stealing offence in no way is measurable against, say, you know, a, uh, a death of a person on the road, whether it be the offender or, or, the, uh, or the police officers or the members of the community and, and that's why we've also introduced those evade police um, laws and we're now 5,500 for, uh, for a mandatory sentence and, uh, and two years loss of licence because from the re research that we actually got uh, was that by having those stiffer penalties there was, uh, there was a, um, a, an impact on those people uh, setting in their minds beforehand to not even go and commission and go that type of offence. So uh, we continue to work on that and we've also got the review early next year in relation to uh, pursuit policies as well. That's right, the new policy um, has only been in existence um, for, well not one year, <coughs> it came into existence on the 19th of December last year, so as the Minister indicated after mm. its first 12 months of operation there will be a review after, mm. its, after the 19th of December. What, what, what is really interesting though about that is that nationally there are different pursuit policies in the, in the various jurisdictions but the phenomenon that we're seeing with unlawful use of motor vehicles, particularly where people break in, steal keys and take the car, that's a national problem. So I think you can actually see there's a divergence of the, uh, of the argument. Mm. Just to clarify, do evade police offences fall under un unlawful use or do they fall under other traffic offences? Yeah, they'd be under a separate category. They wouldn't mm. be under unlawful use. Yeah. Can I come back to you on that? I, I would have hoped they might be in their own category, but um, yeah. How concerned are you about the armed robbery figures? You seem to be getting back to the rates of almost a decade ago. Any plan to deal with that? Yeah, well, very concerned, obviously, um, and certainly um, particularly concerned, although one thing we believe is stable, and that's the, the involvement of firearms in armed robberies. And that tends to fluctuate between about 12% and about 20%. In other words, even at its maximum, 20% um, of uh, armed robberies with the weapon of choice is a firearm. Uh, so around one-fifth. Um, but no, very concerned. And um, uh, I think in recent times uh, our people have uh, had a very good track record in, in apprehending people. Uh, but I think it's one of the most significant crimes on the book. Uh, you know, I mean, the trauma for the victims is just, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing if your home is broken into, but the trauma of people who are confronted by someone with a knife, um, you know, or a firearm or a syringe or whatever the weapon might be, you know, is quite significant. Um, but having said that, um, uh, from where we were 12 years ago, there are less armed robberies today than there were then. Uh, so we just ask, obviously, that we try to keep things in balance and perspective. Okay. Yeah. It's not out of control, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Is there any change in that firearm trend over the past 12 months, those rates? Uh, look, I don't think so, but can I come back to you specifically on that question? But it tends to be that um, 
it's around 12 to 20. Uh, and admittedly, the Gold Coast uh, is up in the higher bracket. So, you know, in terms of the use of firearms, uh, the Gold Coast is running around about around 19% for the mm. use of firearms, or other places in the state, it's down as low as 12% for the use of firearms and armed robberies. But, but can I just come back to you uh, on those specific? That's a degree of detail I just don't want to comment on. I'm absolutely sure about. Mm. Can I also mention up on the screen here in front of you, what you're seeing is uh, a range of. Uh, crime classes that we've uh, put on our police blog site. Uh, that's actually armed robbery and it gives you the offence rates going right back uh, to uh, the 2000s and into the 1990s. So uh, this is available publicly, it's available right now. You can go on and um, I can show you, for instance, if we move to homicide, um, it's simply a click uh, of the mouse and um, uh, well, two clicks of the mouse and that shows you the, uh, the overall rates for homicide over that same period. Um, all of those crime classes you can see at the bottom, um, you can either aggregate it so you can take the whole lot uh, or you can just have single crime classes um, for, uh, and show up the graphs uh, that are available right today. Commissioner, even though you've seen this overall increase, um, are Queensland police on, on top of crime overall, do you think? <coughs> oh, absolutely. Um, and it's not out of control. But having said that, there is still far too much crime, far too much crime. I mean. Um, Twelve years ago in Queensland there were 21,000 vehicles being stolen each year and we got that down to about 9,000 uh, with their best result a couple of years ago and that's bounced back up now to around 11,000. It's still far too many. Um, so, you know, whilst um, I think um, people in the police department have done a good job and we're grateful for the support of the media and the community mm. in that space because most crime is solved because the media give the public information about crime and the public give the police information about crime, and as a result of that public information, the crimes are solved. That, that trilogy of the, the media, the public and the, the police working together is a very good thing. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think there's still significant room for improvement. I really do. Um, I think there's just, you know, still you know, far too much. And, and, and I didn't want you to think, and I'm sure, well, I hope you wouldn't, but by my saying that the real realistically, if you reduce crime every year, which would be lovely, one day there'd be no crime and maybe we could, you know, have a lot less police. Quite frankly, that's not going to happen. Uh, but what we need to get it is to get it down to the lowest level that is possible for Queensland, and I don't think we're there yet. Commissioner, this, this is the last sort of statistics on your watch, I suppose. Um, how disappointing is it for you personally to see that it's gone up by 6% in, in your final Oh, that's a good question. It is disappointing, uh, but we're all disappointed. We're all disappointed. Our goal every year is to do two things, reduce crime mm, and right. increase clear-up rates. So more people get caught, uh, and but there's less crime. That, that's, that's our goal. That's our ultimate goal. And, of course, um, you know, in terms of crime going up, well, that's not what we want to see. We want to see it going in the other direction. All I was trying to do was introduce the debate that, and I don't... Look, the good work in the police department is not done by Bob Atkinson. The good work in the police department is done by the 15,000 people who work in the police department, and they've achieved some wonderful, wonderful results in, in the last uh, decade. They really have. Mm. So what's your view on the gun buyback? I'm sorry? On the gun buyback. Mm. Yeah. What's your view on Oh, no, I'm very supportive of it. I think it's um, a really good move. Uh, I'm very, and I'm not politically aligned, I hope you would believe that and know that, but I think that the proposed, uh, the three dimensions, I think the gun buyback <coughs> is sensible because uh, that gives people a chance to hand in the firearms before the tougher laws come into place. I also have no problem at all with um, trying to reduce red tape for legal firearms owners to make life simpler for them, particularly when they renew their licences. I think if we can do that, that's a good thing. And I'm really grateful though mm. uh, to the Minister and the Government um, because the Minister has led this um, for bringing in proposed tougher laws. And, and the one that I'm particularly grateful for is the proposal that, that basically it's simple as this in my view. If you're a criminal and you're in a public place with a gun, you're going to go to jail. Um, and to me that's a really, really good thing. And just to clarify that, it's, a, it's an amnesty period. It's not a, it's not a buyback no. system. And the other side of that, even that will continue. People still, is still in the act, will still be able to, if they find grandmas or grandpas uh, firearm in the cupboard, they'll still be able to, to bring that into a station or notify a police officer. That's always been in, in there as well. But this is a particular three-month period that will come in for the, the change of the Weapons Act. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the amnesty? Well, we won't know until um, we see. 
and it's certainly worth doing. You know, um, it, it's a little bit unpredictable, um, but it's I think it's a really good thing to do, uh, particularly with the tougher legislation coming in, so that people are given this chance to hand over um, the firearms that they uh, may have in their possession without any risk of any penalty. Mm. Mr. Stewart, how confident are you now that it will be your job um, that you know this time next year? You may have got that figure down. How, how confident are you that you'll be able to do that? Um, I and the rest of the department will be working very hard to, to drive those figures down. And as I said, one of the mantras that I'll be using throughout my uh, time as the Commissioner is for our people to stop crime. Because I do believe, I honestly believe, there are, there are ways that we can do that. Targeting recidivist offenders, having more police out there on the front line, targeting using intelligence-based information to target uh, hot spots, uh, all of those things will, will come into play. But if I could just go back to the firearm issue, uh, having uh, our people uh, certainly asking the public who do have legal firearms to make sure that they are secure at all times is a critical, uh, a critical factor in the fight against crime. And I know the Minister has raised this on many occasions, asking people who legally do have possession of firearms, licensed firearms, that they're locked away where they need to be. Because unfortunately the criminals um, target people who, who are legal firearm owners. Um, and the, uh, having the amnesty for the three month period, again, what that does is reduces the risk that uh, firearms that are out there, perhaps without licenses, um, you know, it might be an antique firearm or a firearm handed down to a family, no one's ever bothered to get a license. If that com comes off the street and goes, uh, comes into our possession and, and ultimately is destroyed, disposed of, it actually takes away <coughs> the potential that, that that firearm will fall into uh, the hands of, of, of the offenders, the crooks out there, who prey on those sorts of uh, offences. Mr Stewart, the, the clearance rates, they seem to be holding steady for both assaults and well, offence against the person and, and property. You've mentioned a review previously of the way police work. Do you want to do something about that? Absolutely. In fact, there's, uh, there's, there's recent uh, evidence from a, um, uh, a research report that was done in England to say that if police skills are up, uh, are increased slightly so that your clear up is, is greater, then that combined, combined with um, truce in sentencing, so uh, slightly longer uh, sentences for, for very hard nosed uh, crooks, uh, that has an immediate impact on the crime rate. So we will be looking at those sorts of things and, and looking at the skilling of our, our own people right across the board. Yeah, even when you look at the assaults on police, you know, we're looking in one, you'll probably see in one period there, in the five year period, there's approximately about 13,500 assaults on police. So one in four police officers are getting assaulted. So that's part of basically improving the standards from right from the academy, or from a police perspective, but also from a Queensland perspective, is that's why we introduce a serious assaults on police from seven to 14 years. And uh, obviously, the killing of a police officer from a, to a 25-year non-parole uh, uh, offence, because uh, that's what we're finding is we've got to obviously, while having more police out there, giving them resources, reducing the red tape and paperwork they have to do, we've also got to make sure that we have penalties that that uh, meet community expectations as well. And uh, there's a number of factors there that we're working on. in terms of far northern region and northern region. How concerning is it with the level of crime up there at the moment? It seems to be a lot of young juvenile mm. offenders getting caught in the last two operations there. Yeah, it's a huge concern to us um, in Cairns and Townsville. Uh, and there are, um, you know, cr crime has gone up in both cities, particularly Cairns. Um, and, um, uh, and regrettably, um, the primary offenders are young males, mm. some as young as 10, between 10 and 20. And it's a huge, huge concern to us. We, we, we're doing all we can uh, in that space. Uh, mm. I wish I could say to you we could fix it tomorrow, but um, uh, it, it's a real issue, um, and I'm, you know, very concerned about it. And again, uh, the linkage, you know, with the theft of vehicles, and then that adds to the risk on the roads as well for people as well with reckless driving. But no, no, it's um, quite rightly identified as a major issue for us. Is this the first time in a decade that the rise in these rates have been so significant? Is that? I yes. mean, you said that there was slight decrease, sorry, slight increases last well, year. Well, in my view, yes, yeah, this is the first time. In fact, perhaps even slightly over a decade. You know, perhaps closer mm. to 12 years, where we've seen um, a jump and a spike like this. Yeah. Mm. And what's really important is that we try and contain that. You know, so at the very least, uh, that it doesn't replicate again next year. Mm. 
How much was the overall increase last um, financial year then? Uh, well, it was at less, significantly less than it is this year, and again, um, that's in the figures. Um, can we come back to you with precise detail on that? Because there's new, we have a lot of detail here, and there's numerous categories of crime. The two that are up the most are car theft um, and break and enters. Arson's up as well. Um, but, um, yeah, those two are the greatest. Um, not that arson isn't a concern to us, but uh, car theft and break and enters. And the overall crime rate, uh, is, is this the first time it's gone up in the past 10 years as well, or is it, how's the overall well, it's crime up, rate? It's up by 6 per cent. Property crime's up by 6 per cent, and the overall crime rate is up by 6 per cent. But, but over the, I think it's the 10-year period, it's still <coughs> down, um, you know, overall, OK? Uh, so it's a blip, but overall, in the last decade, crime is down by 17 mm -hmm. uh, per, well, yeah, 17 per cent overall. Does that make sense? But, but I guess when was the last time it when was the last flip, I suppose? Yeah, I'd have to go back, uh, I'd have to take that question on notice because what was happening was this. Th there was a view in the police department that as the population of Queensland increased, uh, and it was increasing by around 2 to 3 per cent each year, the crime would go up with that population increase. Back in about the year 2000, 2001, we set out to challenge that thinking. And we introduced a process called Operational Performance Review. Uh, and we think that increased effort and emphasis um, changed the thinking in that space and crime started to come down. Um, so um, it's achievable, um, but there's no magic wand or no magic solution. There are a lot of factors with crime. One was touched on today, the economy and people's employment. Another that's been touched on is we're part of the judicial process. We're part of the judicial process. Uh, Ian mentioned sentencing and I think that's valid. Another thing is he also mentioned repeat offenders and that's very relevant for us because if in a given week in, 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 in any town, a major town, a hundred homes are broken into, that's not a hundred separate people doing that. That's a small number of people doing it a lot of times. Uh, and when those people, you know, um, are remanded and remanded and remanded and remanded and continue to commit offences, that just makes it more difficult for us. So what we would ask you as well is to look at this holistically, you know, and recognise, no cop out in our part, we'll do all we can, uh, but we're part of, we're part of a bigger picture. And clearly, with a lot of the robberies, everyone knows and accepts they're drug related. So drug use contributes to armed robberies and any form, any form of robbery. Mm. So what's your, given, given the recidivists, you know, like drug addicts, mm. what's your view on scrapping of the drug court? For sure it's just increasing the processing of the same individuals. Oh, look, I think that's far too early to call. Um, yeah, far too early to call. Uh, and um, it's not something that I'd be you know, qualified to comment on. Um, uh, we, um, we tend to, um, both Ian and I, uh, tend to stay within the police department. You know, our job and, um, is to run the police department, so we tend not to comment on, on, on the courts. But you just uh, said you're part of the constitutional yeah. process. Yeah, and, and, <coughs> and we've, never, have we've never ever, we've never ever, that's right, but we've never ever criticised the judiciary, you know, ever. Um, what, we're, what we're saying is that, that we're part of the process, you know, mm. um, and that and Ian has said it, and I share his view um, that recidivist offenders, repeat offenders, are people committing an enormous amount of crime. If we can, you know, do something about those people, and if that means them staying in custody, well, then so be it. Then, then I think that um, you know we can improve the situation mm. from where we are now. My What's point was simply that. You know, we haven't got thousands of people and thousands of people committing one crime each each day. What we've usually got is small numbers, relatively small numbers of people in any given town, whether it's Cairns or Townsville, uh, committing a lot of crime. What sort of challenges do um, young offenders pose to you, given that it looks like the number of offenders in the 10 to 14 years age group is going up again? Mm -hmm. It is, it is, because... Um, what, what needs to happen in that space, if it's at all possible, is a change in that behaviour. And, and in some cases, um, what that means is, and sadly with some of these young people, there is simply no value at all uh, of, of the worth of education and a job. Uh, those values don't exist. Um, so it, it, it's you know a need to change behaviour, change attitudes and redirect you know, where they are. Otherwise, uh, they'll become adult criminals, they're juvenile criminals, they'll become adult criminals and they'll end up in prison mm. and, and at a cost of $60,000 a year to the state, you know, to keep them in there. So whose attitude has to change, though, then? Uh, yeah, parents, yeah. And 
parents, the people responsible for the upbringing of that child. Yeah. So yeah. you think they're pretty much solid to blame for what the kids are doing at the age of 10? That's a really good question. I've seen families, one in particular that, that I you know, will never forget, they had six children uh, and they, to my mind, were wonderful parents. Uh, and the middle child was the most shocking little criminal you've ever seen. The other five kids all went to uh, school, university and got good jobs. Uh, and yet this, this young fellow, he was just, mm. um, you know, just terrible. Now, I don't know, maybe there's some, you know, genetic um, issue for him. But by and large, in the main, uh, people are a product of their upbringing and the values that are instilled in them, you know, as they grow up. And in the main, yeah, it's, pre it's parents, it's uh, those, those who have the responsibility of nurturing that child and providing that child with, um, with values. Yeah. Mr. Dempsey, do you think that um, the law should target parents Look, I, I know for as a father of five myself, it, uh, it is um, obviously, as the Commissioner alluded to, uh, we all uh, have different children within our, our family make and uh, I think we get a, it's a tendency where we, we push a lot of responsibilities, whether it be back onto education, onto police, onto other community service groups and uh, what we're finding is that seems to be a common trend around the whole of Australia, let alone the world. So it's about people taking responsibilities. But it's also for us as, as a government, that's why we've, you know, we're introducing boot camps. We're looking at uh, bail conditions and we're getting briefs off the QPS and uh, the Attorney General to look at those types of aspects. But uh, to make sure that uh, there is, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously rights and responsibilities and that's a, a quite a balance in there. But, uh, you know, 99% of young children in Queensland are doing the right thing. But we have uh, a... Uh, you might have a, a one particular offender that is uh, causing a significant amount of crime in a particular area. So we're looking at ways to get, get to those young people as early as possible. And, uh, and that's why, you know, as a government, it's not just a police response. Sometimes it's an education, sometimes it's a social issue. It may be a housing issue with uh, parents and extended family as well. So it is an issue. But from the Queensland Police perspective, we're doing all that we can. We uh, have also, uh, as far as even the schools, we've put an extra 15 school-based police officers into our high schools. We're making sure that every school in Queensland will have an adopt-a-cop for the first time. So a person from each station will be assigned to every primary school within their division. So we've, you know, with PCYCs, we see them extending. So from a police perspective, it's about what we can do for the whole of the child as well, but also targeting those particular individuals and getting to them as early as possible. Um, oh, I think we've, between us all here, we've probably touched on some of the prominent things um, and we did discuss, you know, the economic situation and people's financial hardship as a potential contributor. We've talked about drugs and without question, mm. drugs are a primary motivator for uh, crime, uh, in particular, um, you know, um, uh, robberies, uh, where people are clearly quite desperate, you know, in terms of their, uh, their behaviour. Um, uh, in some cases, um, where the theft of vehicles involves joyriding, well, that's just a phenomena all of its own. Um, and um, we've talked about, you know, values generally, and, and I mean, criminality has probably been with us since time began, and people's greed and motivation in terms of criminal behaviour uh, has been something that's with us for a long time. Can I just endorse the Minister's mm. comment, though? I wouldn't want anyone to think, and I hope you wouldn't, that mm. we're... Uh, saying we're being critical of young people. I share the mm. Minister's view. I think our young people today throughout Queensland are quite outstanding. I was privileged recently to be the guest speaker at a high school speech night. You know, just a great school, great young people, great teachers. Um, but as the Minister said, mm. we're talking about a very, very, very tiny, small percentage of young people. But what they do mm. uh, and are doing is committing a disproportionate amount of crime. And one of the questions I was asked earlier was when did we last have a jump like that and it would be back in my view uh, in the 90s uh, but I, I'd have to we'd have to research that and pull that out yeah. and that statistical review that's for the, the last financial year so obviously it's from from what would it be from June 2011 sorry July 2011 to the end of June yeah. the, this year yeah. so what 
while yeah. there may have been a slight increase in the previous financial year, the last that we're talking about now, this is the first significant increase. That's correct. Mm. Yes, yes, for I would yeah. think a good um, 12 years. Yeah. 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 But, but your introduction last year for the Super School of Year because it was pleasing to see a further 3% decrease in the state's overall crime rate. Um, yeah, yeah, but there were some jumps last year. In the, in prior to last year, I mean, that, that's, that's a good result, but prior to last year, uh, pretty much just about every category was going down, you know? Um, and um, now I, I might stand corrected on this, but I think uh, there might have been a slight increase in car theft uh, last year. Uh, all I'm saying is that, that last year wasn't as good a result as we'd had the years before and that this year uh, is the worst result. Yeah, but, but nonetheless, <laughs> we'd ask that people keep it in the context of saying that overall, and some of those slides um, indicate that, mm -hmm. overall the trend is good. Overall the trend is good. Um, and and it's been, there's been some good results. And we are very mindful of the fact <coughs> that uh, we're not saying to you that we're not concerned about this. We are, and we'll do all we possibly can, you know, to redress it. And that's why we were particularly focused on the first three months of this statistical year. Mm. And uh, whilst there's a long way to go, there's still another nine months. Uh, the trend in the first three months is looking better than it has been for the previous 12. Mm. Yeah. So, Michelle, can I ask what will your, be your priority as soon as you get into the new role? <laughs> <laughs> there's probably about 100 of them. Ready start. <laughs> Absolutely. But the reality is, um, I've said it, and I've said it a number of times here today, um, stopping crime uh, will be a mantra. Um, certainly there are a range of reviews already underway uh, into how the police department operates. Now that's no criticism of the past, we've had wonderful stability and leadership for a long period mm, of time. Definitely. But the, uh, the Premier and the Minister have asked us to look very carefully at how we can, uh, are there ways that we can improve the service delivery to the community and I think um, it's self-evident, anyone who reads that document that you've got with you right now will see the variations in crime across this state. And again, next year you'll see further variations. My point is simply this. Uh, the way that we operate in terms of hot spotting, um, I think you'll see greater agility over the next couple of years with task force operations where we can actually uh, mm. follow the leader the, of the, that the government's already put in place where we've put a surge into Cairns, we've put a surge at the Gold Coast. Mm. Uh, you'll see a lot more of that type style of policing where we have a problem, we'll pick up uh, a, a specialist groups of police <coughs> and put them into those areas to attack crime at the roots, mm. uh, both from the, pro the proactive approach, so the intelligence-led approach, um, and then the response approach, where people ring us up and, you know, they've had a crime mm. committed. We'll be targeting all of those things to try and uh, drop crime. Uh, again, all of, the, all of the charts that you're seeing up there on the, on the board, um, they've, been great. they've been great results over the last 10 years. I want to actually try and drive that trend line, continue to have that trend line uh, going down over the next few years. Do you have any plans to target the chief offenders specifically? Look, we've got some wonderful models um, already in place. Um, Logan District, if I can just single them out, uh, not because <laughs> of the, uh, the crime that's committed there, but, but rather the way that the police operate there, uh, they have some very good uh, strategies and tactics, operational tactics, that actually go after recidivist offenders all the time. Um, and it works very, very well for us. So I'm hoping that those learnings, we can repeat those learnings uh, using that surge type mentality or task force mentality when we have a hot spot occurring. Um, you, just, you said the biggest concerns were car thefts and break and enters. Which offence is actually the break and enter? Is it unlawful entry or is it public theft? Or is it public theft? Yeah, unlawful, unlawful entry. entry. Yeah. yeah, and that's when you, when you see that, you know, the peak there. And the peak in the in the unlawful use and the type and the type of offence that a lot of those ones are matched in together in relation to as the commissioner said the, the people are not the modern vehicles are a lot harder to, to get into and we've seen this brazing this increase of people entering into uh, dwellings getting the keys and and that's why we've started an educational program we've been pushing that out Absolutely. quite significantly for people to secure their keys mm -hmm. to think of their keys as an item as a twenty thousand thirty thousand dollar item and securing it properly within their residence to stop that opportunist as well can, can, I, can we just bring up unlawful entry yeah. 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 Mm. That's right. no, no, we didn't say it was entirely due to that. Not we said that, that we think that without a question has contributed. Um, but, um, you know, some people still leave their keys in the car. Mm. Um, yeah. 
Um, and don't lock the and, houses. And some of the cars that are stolen are older vehicles that are still easy to steal. Um, yeah, in some cases ridiculously easy to steal. Um, but that's the, um, and this is all breaking in. This is people's homes, flats, units, shops, businesses. This is the total of, um, of uh, unlawful offentry, entry offences. Um, and my re if my memory serves me correctly, when we started the <coughs> operational performance review process in Queensland, there were around 73,000 breaking into statewide. Um, and that's down now to, um, um, well, around 45, 46,000. Know? Mm -hmm. So even though it's, it's come up a little bit, but again, there's no room for complacency. And uh, it's an awful thing for people. It's a terrible thing uh, when they come home and their homes have been broken into. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the worst things about that, and we see this over and over, is where um, sentimental jewellery that might have been, you know, your grandmother's or something like that is stolen. Um, and whilst the monetary value of it might be mm. $500, the sentimental personal value is priceless. Uh, so you know, don't, don't think in any sense uh, we're, we're minimising the impact on people's lives. Question for the Minister on a, <coughs> another issue. Is there, yep. an, up, is there an update on the, um, on the review of the rural fire service uh, jobs? Look, uh, obviously uh, Ted Malone has started the, uh, the, the uh, rural fire service review. That uh, review is going to be ongoing until uh, what's predominantly the end of the fire season in March this year. I, uh, Ted Malone, I, I spoke to him only yesterday and he was out at Green Bank in Springfield looking at the actual on the ground operations because that was a large operations there yesterday. So what we're particularly looking at is there is the, is the function, the leadership, uh, the structure and also the financial uh, funding for the rural fires in the future. So we'll uh, continue with that through that whole period. And that committee, there's representatives from the Queensland Rural Fire Brigade Association, the Rural Fire Brigade, the Urban Fire Brigade, as well as a, a couple of uh, particular uh, uh, scientific people in relation to the effects of bushfires generally throughout the whole of the state. And that's what we're looking at is not just a, while we're doing a, an obviously a, a review with Ted Malone, we're also looking at the wider picture in relation to, to uh, the history of bushfires within Queensland as well and how it has affected the land. And uh, there's um, a number of different uh, scientific opinions in relation to that, to how we can benefit that, not just from the Queensland Fire and Rescue Service, but also in relation to national parks, in relation to the environmental department in relation to uh, agriculture, as well as uh, how we respond from the Queensland Fire and Rescue Service. So no decision, no decision for a few more months? Though. That's right, until the review's completed, and uh, they're going to 15 other locations and getting feedback throughout the whole of the state uh, in relation to how that structure will be coming, yeah. So. Uh. No, the number of position, commissioned officers has stayed the same. It's around 4% of the organisation, mm -hmm. which is pretty similar to what it is um, throughout Australia. Mm -hmm. um, people will retire and be replaced, but the number's fairly stable. Um, I'm, I'm happy to follow up on that if you wish, but I don't believe there has been a significant increase in the number of commissioned officers. Yeah, I'll come back to you on that one, Robin. Um, to my mind, there's around 400 commission officers statewide, um, and um, uh, in, in a 12-month period, I can't believe that it's gone up by 44. Yeah, if that's what it says here, I'll come back to you on that, but um, uh, it might be just a question of interpretation of the figures, but um, yeah, I don't think that'll be right. Can we talk about that afterwards, mm -hmm. if that's all right? And, and, oh, I think the, the reporter might have gone, but it's just interesting if I could go back to the comment. When you look at the figures as I have them in detail, it would seem as though car thefts up by a couple of thousand and break and are up by about the same amount. So we'll do some more research on that in terms of looking at just how many of those increased break and enters uh, resulted in, you know, um, the keys of the vehicle being stolen, the vehicle being stolen in that regard. That'll take a little while. As will some of those other questions, we might take a couple of days to look at the um, the what you know the percentage of firearms and, and the other one was when did we last have a jump of six percent in property crime 
uh, and overall crime, and that, that could take us a couple of days to, uh, to, to find that information. Mm. Um, with, with your question in relation to, uh, to the robbery in particular, uh, there was 1,813, of which 845 were, were uh, not, uh, uh, no weapons were used. Uh, 462 were for knife. I'm happy to give you this to you at the end of it. A club was 33 in glass. So whilst the classification of a robbery, it doesn't necessitate a, an actual firearm. There's a, there's a broad way of causing fear to facilitate a type of robbery. And whilst any robbery is certainly... Uh, um, we, we certainly don't condone and we'll make sure that we, we do the most to, to, to reduce that um, is uh, there is the people are becoming more brazen in, in relation to the type of, uh, of actually item of their usage yeah. and it seems to be a lot of it is, is an opportunist ones where we've seen other robberies where they've actually picked something up ent on entering and, and, uh, and coming into the actual facility. Yeah. Oh, happy to do that too. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Um, Mr Stewart. No, certainly. Thanks, Mr. Commissioner. Um, what we're trying to do is to give um, some indication of the, of the trends uh, in relation to uh, uh, a whole range of the crime classes. Um, James, I wonder if you just go up to the police blog site. Uh, it's there? Yeah, so this is our, our My Police uh, data blog site. And uh, certainly that crime, I mean, you can drive it yourself. Uh, people can go online onto mm. that site, simply click on the crime class and or, or several crime, crime classes as we, we see there, um, and you'll see the comparative data uh, in the trend lines. Look, there's a whole range of, uh, of issues that relate to that, but the, but the government is very, very keen on, mm. on us getting as much data out there to the public as possible. And there's very good reason for that, and, and that is that, um, A, and the Commissioner touched on this before, if, uh, if someone was to see that there was a, a crime uh, in their area, they may actually have some information, and so that might jog, jog their memory about, oh, I saw a car acting suspiciously and I took a registered number down, but I didn't think it'd come to anything. Um, but yes, I looked online, I saw that there was a, a crime in the area during that week um, mm. that might have some bearing on it. So there's some very good reason for that. The other, the other thing, uh, the other real benefit of having mm. data online uh, is that we, we get lots and lots of re, uh, re research requests for, for data. Mm. Um, once we go live with that, um, it will allow researchers um, from across the world to actually look at the, the data and use that uh, and analyse it and pr perhaps provide information for us on, on, um, on issues uh, <coughs> pertaining to that particular uh, yeah. crime hotspot. Yeah, this is only the first step in relation to that open data and, and transparency as well. And, and as the, uh, the Commissioner uh, designate also uh, alluded to, is when you see the reported crime, often you don't get what the clear up of that crime is That's in a particular right. area. So it reduces that fear of crime. If you have a break in it, it's for someone to know that it's actually, that offender has actually been caught and, and it helps ease that, that perception. Mm -hmm. But also, what the beauty about having more data out there, it engages the community. Because at the end of the day, police are as only as good as the information they receive. And being open and putting more data out there avails to the open community that there is nothing to hide. That you've got the, all the information, you feed it back, nuts and bolts back to the police service. So it's about getting information from the whole of the community back in a timely manner so that also police are able to be able to, when they're doing their resources, to be able to align those resources to those particular issues in a more timely manner. Because uh, as we talk, of, that's why we've introduced increased funds to Crime Stoppers and Neighbourhood Watch. The My Police blogs, we've done six of them so far, they're going out through the whole state. And that has been a phenomenal response in relation to people actually wanting to get off of those particular sites because they're identified, because that's linked into other social networks that people uh, are coming in for minor offences and giving themselves up. So it's, it really is a great source. And uh, as far as uh, that whole technology advancements within the QPS and mobile data, it's very exciting and uh, I'm looking forward to the year. Well, we're not talking in years, yeah, so uh, we're, hop we'll, we'll be, we'll be wor we're working on that currently 
And, uh, but what we want to make sure is that uh, we have as much information as possible. And we want to make sure that we get it right and uh, that we don't have to keep coming backwards. And, uh, and so years. Have you seen it in six months' time? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it will be six months, but this is our toe in the water and we'll be rolling out as, as the systems come mm. online, as yep. they are proven to be accurate. Mm. And uh, the other side of it is we think that they will be very well used by the public and researchers, so we have to make sure that the systems are, are robust enough to deal with that. Um, that takes some time in testing, so I can't give you a date or a, or a time frame, but what we are doing is working hard behind the scenes towards improving this type of data access. But exactly what you said, that is what we want to be out there, so people will be able to uh, identify whether you know, um, you know, what type of offence is where they are. There'll be obviously a number of apps that will come out in relation to that, but uh, I can only see that as a benefit. That, I'll go uh, sorry, I, there, I am sure that mm. there will be apps of yes. here yes. that will give you um, your suburb and it will give you the crime that's happening in your suburb that's mm. being reported on our online products. Mm. Uh, as, you know, as, it, as that's updated, the app will update it for We've you. seen that happen elsewhere in the world. Exactly. So, so people, there's no, um, you know, you know um, yeah, but no doubt that it'll, 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 it'll come this way. Well, people, you've normally seen other uh, enterprises adapt apps in relation to even, you know, whether it be speed cameras, whether it be uh, some uh, trucking firm may be driving on certain roads that uh, can now be able to identify the best route for their, for their drivers to go. For, uh, it might be able to, you know, what uh, uh, blockages there is are heading traffic. And that, that's good for their companies. It saves their companies uh, valuable dollars and times as well. So there is a lot of apps. There's a lot of enterprising people out there, but we want to have all the information as possible out there in the community. So it'll be, uh, I can see it being a, a, a different world in relation to uh, having uh, statistical reviews in the future. Yep. Yeah, we, we did. I'm um, sorry, we did actually have something at 11. But um, if, if uh, follow up on those things that you've raised, um, and uh, was there anything else before we go? Yeah. Hey, thanks very much for your Thank time. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate did it. Did you want that? Yes. We're going to have. How about that? This done. Um, okay. That's just for this year. That's just for this year. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Just show.